Schwab Asset Management is proud to support the Inside ETFs podcast. As one of the nation's largest ETF providers, Schwab Asset Management offers insights and perspectives that can help advisors build on their ETF expertise. Did you know that more millennials are choosing ETFs as their investment vehicle of choice, or that many investors plan to increase their allocation to fixed income, smart beta, and actively managed ETFs? Find out how ETFs can support your clients' goals with Schwab Asset Management's educational resources. Learn more at schwabassetmanagement.com forward slash ETF know-how. Hello and welcome to Inside ETFs, the podcast where we bring the latest and greatest ETF industry perspectives directly to you through in-depth conversations with key thought leaders from across the ETF ecosystem. I'm your host, Douglas Jonas, the head of exchange traded product at the New York Stock Exchange, the home of ETFs. Now, today I'm joined by Joel Schulman. He's the founder, CEO, and CIO of ER Shares. With over 25 years of research at Babson College, Dr. Schulman is the author of a best-selling book developed while at Harvard University, and no surprise, Dr. Schulman formed a proprietary investment model and something called the Entrepreneur Factor. His company, ER Shares, runs a range of award-winning investment solutions across SMAs, mutual funds, and of course, ETFs. Joel, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Thanks, Doug. It's always a pleasure uh, to chat with you. So let's start at the beginning. How did you get into the ETF business? Well, we um, so I, as you mentioned, I'm a college professor. I've been a college professor for 25 plus years at Babson, which is known to be the leader in entrepreneurial studies. And uh, I also was a CFA test prep provider. So um, m- many of your listeners may be familiar with the Chartered Financial Analyst designation. And I was um, the number three provider globally in providing preparation services for these people. And so I trained about 12,000 people in about 110 countries around the world. And, and while training many of these people who later became leaders in the investment industry, including students who later became the CIO Schwab or the CIO of Fidelity among others, I decided um, I wanted to manage some money too. I, I sold my CFA test prep business in uh, 2004 and I launched a long short equity hedge fund, which uh, focused on this, uh, what, what it means to be an entrepreneur, publicly traded entrepreneurial company. We ran this long short equity hedge fund. So we were sh- going long entrepreneur short, uh, short what we deemed to be bureaucrats. We ran this for a number of years and later we decided to, to become an ETF to, to appeal to the, um, the, the public. And of course, you now have two ETFs listed with the New York Stock Exchange. But if you look back, you know, on on that career journey, were there key moments? Were there key events? Something that that said to you, "Hey, you know what? We we need to. We're running money. We need to launch our own ETFs." Right. So we were one of the first thematic investment strategies out there back when we were talking about this in two thousand four. You know, nobody really knew what it meant to be an entrepreneur. I mean, people knew that people like Sam Walton or Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, these were entrepreneurs, but nobody really knew what that meant. And and so there's no real model there. It's not like you can go to a database on Bloomberg or Capital IQ and plug in, you know, entrepreneur. So we had to comprise, we had to build a model. It was based on the research I did while at Harvard University. I, I wrote a book with the former president, Chrysler Daimler. And basically, we were trying to figure out what it meant to be a good company or a great company over time. And we came up with a model in terms of what it meant to be entrepreneurial. We used the research at Babson. So I published um, probably 20 papers in, in the public domain on what it means to be an entrepreneur. And from that, we started seeing interest in what we were doing. People didn't really believe that there's such a thing as an entrepreneur model, but people started showing interest. And we decided, you know what, that there's you know, that this concept uh, should really be a product for uh, for, for retail investors and institutional investors that uh, want a, a special proprietary um, you know, risk factors. So that's what we did. And now you've been a professor. You're at Babson College for many years. Yeah. I'll let you decide if you want to disclose your annual salary. One of the few uh, college professors I know that does. What is it that drives you? Because it's it's clearly not you're not working for the money. You're you're driven yeah. by this energy. 
Yeah. Or is it is it just this next generation of investors? What what pulls you in every every semester? Well, so a few years ago, I mean, you know, I'm a professional money manager, as you know, and I decided I don't really need the money. And I, I'm a tenured full professor, but I didn't want to teach six classes, five classes a year. So I told them, I, you know, I love being a professor. I never want to give that up, uh, but I'll do it for a dollar, right? Um, and if I do a good job, you'll pay me $2 or so next year. So they, 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 um, I, I have a special arrangement where I, they, they actually paid me a little more than a dollar. I said I'd do it for a dollar, but it, I teach one class a year. Uh, primarily for fun. I mean, that's what I do. And I, I love being a professor and the energy from the students and what they bring to the table and the ability to bring other people in from industry. So I bring a lot of famous people in from industry, accomplished entrepreneurs, accomplished business professionals who love to speak to students and they enjoy they they enjoy having an audience of, of young minds who are receptive to, to, ju- to just great information and learning. And and I've been fortunate over the years, many of my students have gone on to build their own businesses. Some are publicly traded or bought by publicly traded companies. One of my students a few years ago uh, was bought for over a billion dollars. One of the guys who's working with me now is a serial entrepreneur. When he was an undergrad, he was making more money than all his faculty. He later sold out for hundreds of millions of dollars as a serial entrepreneur. I've got other students that um, you were considering going public w- with the company. They're not even 30 years old. And they had a chance to go public with a company worth $200 million. And, and so I'm seeing a lot of these interesting ideas and concepts. We're, we're like a little you know, think tank for entrepreneurial entrepreneurial companies. And it's it's just really exciting to be around. And so uh, I feed off that energy and and uh, never want to give it up. Yeah, I think it's so great. You know, it's, it's part of, I think, our roles, right, as we've kind of journeyed into the financial system and, and, you know, those that are willing to take on interns and take on the younger crowd and and teach and educate them. It's so, so important. I think even for me, I went into college thinking I was going to be an engineer and, and uh, I did a, a site visit with a money manager who happened to live in my neighborhood, my next door neighbor. I think I cut his lawn. He invited me to come with him to, to visit him in the office and see what he did for a living and how he helped people carve out their, their, their future financial uh, planning and it just really hit me and it, it changed my whole scope of where I was heading. So for those of you listening, please invite young people into your life and teach them what you do, especially the advisors out there. Uh, you never know what difference you're making. So so obviously you're surrounded by this entrepreneurial spirit, but then you've coined and potentially patented this phrase entrepreneurial factor. Tell us what that means. So the entrepreneur factor is comprised of our model. So we have a rules-based model that evaluates 56,000 plus publicly traded companies around the world. And we sort them into various cohorts. And so there's a number of data points that we evaluate that that comprise what it means to be an entrepreneur. And between the periods of 2005 to 2020, just up to COVID, this passive, we had a passive index that created a a systematic risk factor that was, you know, that was classified as the, the entrepreneur factor that significantly outperformed the market. It was a, it was a you know a, a very significant risk adjusted alpha that was attributed to the selection bias. And so there's a, a selection effect associated when people do you know factor analysis. You know they look for various um, criteria, and the factor, the entrepreneur factor, stood out is the most significant factor for the period 2005 to 2020. Now during a, a long bull market, you know there's nothing better. You know obviously. You know, things correct and there are people in the marketplace well well-known funds that have since popped up we were the first thematic in this space to be an innovator disruptor entrepreneur company there are others who came along later on one person in particular uh that's comprised almost exclu- in fact not almost exclusively with entrepreneurial companies raised 50 billion dollars a couple of years ago i think most people probably know the name but but it's the same space i mean and there, there are probably a dozen copycats now in the space but we were the first uh, first in this area, and we're proud to have had the only real research in this area is peer review, academically uh, accepted journals uh, or academic journals, peer reviewed. And uh, we're proud to have that research and actually help establish that space. So so tell us a bit more. You, you've launched two ETFs, ENTR and ERSX. Right. Tell, tell us a bit about that and the process of launching and, and how you sort of think about Think about that for your business. So the the entrepreneur. So the one is is largely 
um, is largely publicly traded U.S. based firms. So the ENTR is large cap entrepreneurial companies, U.S. based entrepreneurial companies, whereas ERS, ERSX is the polar opposite. So it, it's it's non-U.S., primarily non-U.S., small cap companies. And, and, and so what we do is we try to pick up the risk attributes of these entrepreneurs you know, globally. So one was designed to compete against large cap space. And again, during periods of a bull market, you know, there's not, nothing better than these categories. So through, you know, 2001, early 2001, when we were still running a strong bull market, we, we were number one across the board. And we, we were, you know, um, a, again, the top fund. Now, as we know, since that time, we we're primarily a growth oriented fund. And so as we know, in 2001, and early part 2002, growth funds, growth stocks have, have been out of favor. Uh, but we think that's actually a, a very attractive time to come into the market now. And so if people believe that um, inflation has peaked as we do, uh, and we're now speaking towards the end of July 2022, uh, we believe inflation has peaked. We think the next data read is going to show that inflation has peaked. We think the second half of the year is going to, to be strong. The same thing is true globally. So what we found is that entrepreneurs have a way to pivot, you know, and they tend to beat the bureaucrats over a long period of time. There's nothing better for a company when the entrepreneur is good. And if the, it, by that we mean that they, they have economic incentive to create value for themselves and the shareholders with their public stock. However, when the entrepreneur is bad, there is nothing worse because they have the ability to uh, take value at the expense of the shareholders. Now, up until recently, we've seen most of the publicly traded entrepreneurs, what we would put in the category is, is good. In, in recent times, we, we're now starting to observe and we're tracking some new variables, you know, with our, our models. So we're constantly doing upgrades, you know, to, that this time we're not going to put in the, in the popular press because we don't want everybody to replicate it. But we have some new variables that we're looking at to add on top of our model to make sure that we are able to differentiate good from bad entrepreneurs and also to make sure that we have some other metrics put into place that help protect investors, you know, when, when market conditions change. So these are new criteria we're adding on top of our, of our uh, factor. And, and these are things that now are making it instead of a passive fund, we're now making it more active to be, to adapt to, to changing market conditions. Yeah, you know, and I wanted to to sort of jump in as we mentioned. You know, you've got you're award winning across your money management business. You're running SMAs. You're running mutual funds. How how do the ETFs? You know, the that we're talking about here, right? How, how does ENTR? How does ERSX differ, if you will, from the other investment solutions that that you know family offices and advisors can be can come to you about today? Well, so traditionally, um, you know, our ETFs were, were rules-based and completely passive. And so um, it was just as an index. We ran it as an index. It, it, it was designed to compete with the Russell 1000 uh, as a general category for the large cap and, and then a uh, FTSE a small cap index for the for the uh, ERSX. So we, we were designed to compete against passive indices. Now, since we've become more active, there are other you know, sort of there are other entrepreneurial funds out there, or disruptive funds or innovator funds that are well known that we're just now designed to compete for that space. And so we're, we're more we're more geared towards investors who are looking for exceptional rates of return over a long period of time. So we're not we're not putting concentration risk. So it's not like we'll do 10 percent in a single position as some of our um, some of the other funds may do in the space. So we won't take you know, individual company risk, but we will take the entrepreneur factor risk and we'll spread it over more companies during, during you know, volatile times as we have now. And then as times become more stable, we'll increase concentration with fewer companies. So entrepreneurs who are professional investors can look at this is a, is a fund to put in their uh, basket of, of funds that uh, will take on, uh, take on these, these entrepreneur characteristics. It's a little bit more volatile than a, uh, an S&P 500 or Russell 1000, but the, the upside over a longer period of time is much stronger. Retail investors know this because they tend to embrace this. They tend to be less diversified to begin with. They tend to, if anything, hold one or two stocks in some of the, the popular names. But what we do is allow them to have a basket of stocks that have done a, a thorough pre-screening. So they'll have the criteria of characteristics that they like, which tend to be high growth, exciting organizations disruptors, innovator, entrepreneur companies. And we do it both US and, um, and globally. In terms of the mutual funds, 
uh, we worth considering bringing those over into the ETF fold. So, so you know, Joel, I have to ask. You mentioned uh, inflation. Probably that word is is dominating the press. We're recording this late July, twenty twenty two. There, there can be some negative sentiment just about anywhere you turn. Yeah. When you look out at the capital markets, do you see opportunities? Are are there opportunities in the market today? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. A, a lot of times, I mean, you know, there are some famous ambassadors who tell you to jump in, you know, when others are leaving and so forth, and we think. We, we think the um, the contrarian ambassador is now looking at this as an opportunity. The markets were, have been beat up, particularly the high growth uh, stocks have been beat up since really February 2021. So it's about a year and a half almost that they've had a steady decline down. And the valuations now are looking attractive. There's some well-known names, some highly popular companies that have traditionally been very popular that on a price to earnings to growth ratio, so it's known as the PEG ratio. So you take PE and you adjust it for growth are actually better and more attractively priced than well-known companies like Walmart or or Target or even Coca-Cola. So if investors look at price earnings to growth ratios, we'll see that some of the traditional staples even are relatively high. And if you look at the, the growth charts or the, the price charts of the stock market, you'll see companies like Coca-Cola, Walmart, and Target relatively flat for 20, 30 years. And then 2020, 2022, they spike quite a bit, you know, in some cases, two, 300%. And this is just atypical for these companies, but a lot of passive investors on the value side have poured into these companies to the point where they've now pushed them up. And meanwhile, the growth stocks have plummeted. So we think there's going to be a reversion to the mean. And we believe the second half of the year is actually going to be very good for these high growth stocks that have been beaten up so badly and are now on a relative to growth basis are priced attractively. And some, this is the key, some companies are actually able to widen the margins or bringing the costs down. I mean, I'm sorry, they're able to increase the gross margins, bring the SGA down because of technology in some cases and widen, actually widen the EBITDA. They, we're, we're finding and we're looking for these companies globally and, and we found some and these entrepreneurs are very good at that. What should advisors know about your ETFs? And you know, are are you planning to to bring more strategies to the ETF market? Yes, we are. So they they should know that we currently have some mutual funds. Uh, we have a global fund, this mutual fund. We have a, a small cap, uh, and, and we have another large cap fund that we're thinking of bringing over is ETFs that uh, will widen the appeal and the ability to buy these things, you know, for the for the market. And and we think these traits, these attributes, the, the entrepreneur factor over a long period of time stands out regard irrespective of market cap, irrespective of, of country and irrespective of industry, although they tend to be concentrated in four industries. They tend to be in IT, healthcare, consumer discretionary, and in communication services. So they tend to be in four categories. So th those are the categories that dominate, but over a long period of time, these things tend to, to outperform the market. And advisors should know that if they're looking to add a little bit more you know, equity risk in there, that these are very attractive strategies to stand up. And again, they're probably already considering some of our competitors that have you know, funds with billions of dollars in size. What I can tell you is that those strategies tended to have been based off of ours, we're the original and we're we're making cons, you know consistent improvements on it because it, you know it's the IP that we're we're known for and continue to refine. So, Dr. Shulman, for advisors that are out there and they say, "Hey, I, I want to learn more," whether it be about the entrepreneur factor, about ER shares, you, your team, aside from maybe subscribing to your course at Babson, is there a uh, a best way that they could come and engage with you and your team? Yeah, I mean, we're Boston based. Um, we're, we're easily accessible. They can call us, they can email us. I mean, we, we would be remiss to say that you're, we're not reachable, right? I mean, that's completely opposite how an entrepreneur would actually live who's running a company and we feel like we're the same thing. So they, they can reach us and we're delighted to speak to them anytime. And of course, uh, Dr. Shulman is is heavily engaged in the media. You'll often find him on CNBC TV. Uh, you can follow him in, on social media as well. So we invite you to do that as well as visit his website, ershares.com. Dr. Shulman, thank you so much for joining. That is a wrap on this edition of the Inside ETFs podcast. As a reminder, you can find this episode as well as many other episodes of this podcast on the New York Stock Exchange's website, 
homeofetfs.com. Thank you again, Joel, for being here, sharing your insights. For those listening, stay tuned for upcoming episodes featuring thought leaders from across the ETF ecosystem. I'm Douglas Jonas, head of exchange traded funds at the New York Stock Exchange, the home of ETFs. Schwab Asset Management is proud to support the Inside ETFs podcast. As one of the nation's largest ETF providers, Schwab Asset Management offers insights and perspectives that can help advisors build on their ETF expertise. Did you know that more millennials are choosing ETFs as their investment vehicle of choice, or that many investors plan to increase their allocation to fixed income, smart beta, and actively managed ETFs? Find out how ETFs can support your clients' goals with Schwab Asset Management's educational resources. Learn more at schwabassetmanagement.com forward slash ETF know-how.